Lecture 15, Perceptual Organization and Pattern Recognition. Gibson's ecological view of direct perception assumes that all the information needed for perception is present in the stimulus itself, the stimulus being broadly construed, and that what happens in perception is that the perceptual apparatus extracts this information from perception. This means that perception is determined by the stimulus, meaning the whole pattern of proximal stimulus information that's available to the observer in the environment. It's a very straightforward, very appealing view of perception. Just as the doctrine of specific fiber energies stimulated research on the physiological substrates of various qualities of sensation, so Gibson's ecological view has stimulated a search for the various kinds of information available in the stimulus environment that are picked up by the perceptual apparatus. And, as I say, this is a very interesting view of perception, and it's been very widely adopted in some quarters of psychology. But it has a number of problems, one of which is conceptual. It might be possible to show that information about motion or distance or rigidity is available in the environment, but it's quite another thing to show that the perceiver actually makes use of this information. Gibson's analysis of the stimulus environment often relies on very complex mathematical entities like ratios, and it's just not at all clear that observers really use this information, even if it's available in the environment. Setting this conceptual problem aside, the ecological view encounters a number of empirical problems, that is, problems with how people actually perform in perception experiments, and for that matter in the real world, that suggest that the ecological view is not the entire picture of perception. Yes, the stimulus provides information for perception, and yes, perceivers are able to extract some of this information and make use of it in the course of forming mental representations of the world. But there are other things going on as well, and it's those other things that are the topic of this lecture. For one thing, there are certain aspects of perceptual experience that just can't be accounted for by the stimulus information available to the perceiver. This point was underscored in the 1920s and 1930s by a group of perception theorists known as the Gestalt School of Psychology. This included Max Wertheimer and Wolfgang Köhler and Kurt Kafka. Gestalt is a German word that roughly translates as whole or whole configuration. And the Gestalt psychologists focused on the tendency of the mind to organize individual stimuli into groups or sets, to fuse stimulus elements into a perceptual whole. As a school of psychology, the Gestalt theorists were opposed to the structuralism of Wundt and Titchener and others who dominated psychology up until that time. Structuralism was based on a kind of atomism, that is, there were elementary sensory experiences, elementary qualities of sensation, which, like atoms, were built up into more complex sensory experiences, somewhat analogous to molecules. The structuralists attempted to analyze complex perceptual experiences into their elementary constituents. But from a gestalt point of view, you can't do that. You can't analyze perceptual experience into its elementary constituents because the elements interact in such a way that, as they like to put it, the whole is different from the sum of its parts. They argued for a holistic position, that the elements of a stimulus array, when put together as an organized whole, that organized whole would have emergent properties, properties that couldn't be deduced from the elements that it was comprised of. The principles of the Gestalt approach to perception can be summarized in terms of what's known as the Law of Pregnans, a German word which can be translated as pithiness, but which means roughly good form. The Law of Pregnans says simply that perception will be as good as stimulus conditions allow, 
and that when stimulation is ambiguous, we perceive the simplest or most homogeneous or best organization that will fit the sensory pattern. For example, this figure can be perceived as a circle lying behind a square. Remember the principle of superposition that we discussed last time. But it can also be viewed as a three-quarters circle next to a square. That's a perfectly good perception. As an analysis of the stimulus, it's perfectly good in the abstract, perhaps, but when you look at it, you don't see that. You see a circle behind a square. That is the simplest, most homogeneous organization that will fit the pattern of sensation. That's what we see. According to the Gestaltus, perception has to account for the stimulus. But perception involves more than unpacking the stimulus array. The law of pregnans, what's sometimes known as the minimum principle, that's not in the stimulus. That's in the mind of the perceiver. And the phenomena of perception that interested the Gestalt psychologists so much illustrated ways in which the mind, the perceptual apparatus, actually imposed structure on a stimulus. These phenomena, these empirical observations, are nicely summarized in what have come down to us as the classic Gestalt principles of perception, principles that were articulated by Wertheimer, Köhler, Kafka, and other Gestalt psychologists in the 20s and 30s. Let's go through these now, one at a time. According to the principle of proximity, we group objects together that are near each other. So, in the first row of this figure, we see ten dots, but in the second row of the figure, we see five pairs of dots instead of ten dots. Yes, there are ten dots there, but that's not what we see. We see five pairs. According to the principle of similarity, we tend to group objects together based on similarity in appearance. In the first row, we see pairs of dots grouped together according to similarity of color. In the second row, we see pairs of dots grouped together according to similarity in size. And in the third row, we see pairs of dots grouped together according to similarity of orientation. No matter what the dimension, if objects are similar to each other, we tend to group them together. According to the principle of common fate, we tend to group objects together based on whether they move together in the environment. If the first pair of dots moves down and the second pair of dots moves up, we see the first two as a pair and the second two as a pair. Similarly, we'd see the first, third, and fifth pairs of dots as a group and the second and fourth pair of dots as another group because they're moving in the same direction. And according to the symmetry principle, we tend to group objects together that are mirror images of each other. These are just random lines. They don't have any meaning. But the second from the left is the mirror image of the first, and the second from the right is the mirror image of the last. Accordingly, we tend to see the first and second as belonging together, and the third and fourth as belonging together, but not belonging with the first and the second. In the same way, we perceive the second line as belonging with the first, but not the third, and the third line as belonging with the fourth, but not the second. And, according to the principle of parallelism, we tend to perceive parallel lines as belonging together. Again, we see the second line as belonging with the first, not the third, and the third line as belonging with the fourth, and not the second. These four lines are grouped perceptually into two pairs, two pairs of parallel lines according to the principle of parallelism. According to the Gestalt principle of closure, we tend to fill in the missing parts of a stimulus. Thus, we tend to see this figure as a closed circle rather than as a circular arrangement of dashes. And according to the principle of good continuation, perception avoids abrupt shifts in direction. Thus, in this figure, we tend to see a curve crossed by a straight line, rather than four lines 
two curves and two straight, which intercepted a point. We could also see a curved line coming in from the upper left and then straightening out and going out to the upper right, and a straight line coming in from the lower left and then curving out to the lower right. Instead, we see a curved line and a straight line, and that's good continuation. There's nothing in the stimulus that requires us to see it this way. It's just the way we see it. We see it the way we see it because of the application of these various principles which impose themselves on the stimulus. These principles have all been widely accepted in perception psychology since the 1920s and 1930s. But recently, Stephen Palmer and his associates have described a couple of new gestalt principles of perception. Principles like the classic principles, but ones that the early gestalt psychologists simply hadn't thought of. For example, the new principle of synchrony states that elements that change their properties at the same time tend to be grouped together. So, if a light blue dot changes to a dark blue dot, at exactly the same time as a dark blue dot changes to a light blue dot, these two dots will be perceived as belonging together. According to the principle of grouping by common region, stimulus elements that occupy the same region of space are grouped together. In this illustration, regions in space are denoted by the oval-shaped envelope and elements that occur inside each of these envelopes tend to be grouped together. This occurs even when the elements are far apart compared to other elements that are in different regions, as in the second row with the red dots. Finally, according to the new principle of connectedness, elements that are connected with other elements tend to be grouped together. And again, this is true even when the connected elements can be closer to other elements to which they're not connected, as in the second row with the red dots. A lot of these gestalt principles come together in what's known as the Kanisha figure, devised by Guitano Kanisha in 1976, and similar kinds of illusions. Note that the stimulus consists of three Pac-Man-type circles with three acute angles. But that's not what we see. What we see first is a triangle, an equilateral triangle pointing upward created by the three Pac-Men, and another equilateral triangle pointing downward created by the three acute angles. Neither triangle is in the stimulus. It's created by our visual system. There's nothing about the stimuli themselves that requires these organizations. Many different organizations of these stimuli are possible, but according to the Gestalt psychologists, the visual system, operating according to Gestalt principles, creates or prefers one organization over the other, the simplest, most homogeneous organization that will fit the pattern of sensory stimulation. The Kanisha figure shows dramatically that perception involves more than analyzing the array of stimulus information. These triangles are not in the stimulus. They're in the mind of the perceiver. They're not given by the stimulus array. They're created by the perceptual apparatus. A more recent set of problems for the ecological view is posed by what's known as the information processing view of perception that is based on a kind of computer metaphor for vision and thinking. The first step in perception from the information processing view is a process of feature detection in which the perceiver analyzes the stimulus and, is, and extracts its elementary features. This is a process that would be very familiar to Gibson and the other ecological perception theorists, a process of finding out what features are in the stimulus array. But according to the information processing view, the process of feature detection is followed by a process of pattern recognition, where the perceiver puts all these elementary features together to synthesize a mental representation of the distal stimulus. This process of pattern recognition draws on memory, draws on the perceiver's knowledge about the stimulus environment, and permits the perceiver to recognize some patterns of elementary features as familiar 
and meaningful, and other patterns as novel or meaningless. As I said, the idea of feature detection followed by pattern recognition is closely associated with computer models of cognition that began to be developed in the 1950s and 1960s. But also influential was work on the neurophysiology of the visual system. In a classic experiment by Letvin and his colleagues, various visual stimuli were presented to a frog while they recorded the activity of specific fibers in the frog's optic nerve. And what they discovered was that there were certain fibers in the optic nerve that were responsive only when certain stimuli were presented. This, by the way, was the kind of thing that Helmholtz had in mind with his doctrine of specific fiber energies. He understood that the afferent nerves were composed of large numbers of afferent neurons, fibers, and he simply proposed that some of the fibers are sensitive to some form of stimuli as opposed to others. And that's exactly what Letvin found. For example, one set of fibers is responsive only to the presentation of a sustained contrast, an edge that divides space into light and dark regions. Other fibers became active only when the frog was presented with a net convexity, that is, a dark dot presented against a light background, or a light dot presented against a dark background. These fibers are now commonly known as the bug detector for the frog. There were other fibers that responded only when an edge moved across the visual field, and still other fibers that responded only when the illumination was reduced. So it appears that the frog's visual system is organized in such a way as to analyze its environment into elementary features, edges, dots, moving edges, and changes in illumination. Extrapolating just a little bit, Letvin jokingly suggested that in humans we might have grandmother cells, fibers in our visual system that responded only to the appearance of our grandmother. At roughly the same time, Hubel and Wiesel were doing similar experiments by recording the activity of single cells in the visual cortex of cats. Again, the idea was to present particular stimuli in the cat's visual field and then record the activity of single neurons, or very small bundles of neurons, in response to that stimulus. And what they found was that, indeed, there were certain cells in the visual cortex that became active when the animal was presented with a point of light, or a point of darkness, or only when it was an edge between light and dark regions in space, or if there was a bar of light against a dark ground, or a bar of dark against a light background. There were cells that responded to bars, but only when they were at particular angles of orientation, vertical, horizontal, 45 degrees, whatever. There were cells that responded to points and edges and bars that moved, but not points, edges, or bars that were stable. And there were cells that responded only to a particular directional movement, up and down, or left and right. For this work, Hubel and Wiesel shared the Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine with Roger Sperry for pioneering work on the visual system. On the basis of their research, Hubel and Wiesel identified two or three basic kinds of feature detectors in the visual system. So-called simple cells respond to a particular stimulus that appears in a particular area of the visual field. For example, a point of light appearing in the upper left quadrant of visual space. Thus, simple cells report not just the presence of a feature, but also its location in space. Complex cells respond to a particular feature, like a point of light, but appearing anywhere in a field. Thus, complex cells report only the presence of a feature. They don't report its location as well. Early work by Hubel and Wiesel also seemed to indicate a category of hypercomplex cells, which respond to combinations of simple features, such as those that form corners, curves, and angles and they're also responsive to size, large or small. 
But it now seems that the so-called hypercomplex cells responding to combinations of features really are special classes of simple or complex cells. The point is that Hubel and Wiesel discovered that there were parts of the visual cortex that, in fact, were responsive to the presence of particular features in the environment. And that's what feature detection is all about. To get a sense of how feature detection works in the case of the human visual system, consider the process of recognizing letters, printed letters, like in the alphabet. In principle, all of the letters in any written language can be decomposed into a relatively small set of features. In English, for example, all the letters are composed of some combinations of just seven elementary features. Three types of lines, vertical, horizontal, and oblique, two kinds of angles, right angles and acute angles, and two kinds of curves, continuous and discontinuous. For example, in English orthography, the uppercase letter A is composed of one horizontal line, two oblique lines, and three acute angles. By contrast, the letter B is composed of one vertical line, three horizontal lines, four right angles, and two discontinuous curves. The letter O is composed of just a single continuous curve. And the letter R is composed of one vertical line, one oblique line, two horizontal lines, and one discontinuous curve. All of the letters in English, printed English, can be decomposed into features in just exactly that way. But we don't just analyze the visual stimulus into its constituent features. We also recognize particular combinations of features as familiar and meaningful. That's the process of pattern recognition. We see a vertical line, three horizontal lines, four right angles, and two discontinuous curves, and we recognize that it is a, a B as opposed to an A, or an O, or an R. First, feature detection, then pattern recognition. But, and here's the point, we only recognize these patterns because we know how to read English. If we didn't know how to read English, these wouldn't mean anything to us. So, for example, German has a letter pronounced Sisset, which stands for the double S. The letter looks a little bit like the English B, but it has a little tail created by the fact that the lower discontinuous curve isn't connected to the vertical line by a horizontal line. If you didn't know German, you wouldn't recognize this as familiar, and you wouldn't have any idea that it stood for a particular pattern of sound. In Greek, the letter gamma is composed of one horizontal and one vertical line. The letter pi, one horizontal and two vertical lines. The letter theta, one continuous curve and one horizontal line. The letter phi, one continuous curve and one vertical line. The letter psi, as in psychology, a discontinuous curve and a vertical line. And omega, a discontinuous curve and two horizontal lines. When you learn to read Greek, you learn to recognize these patterns of features as meaningful but they're the same features that you find in printed English. In Russian, the letter Z is composed of two discontinuous curves, or perhaps two curves of line that meet at oblique angles, one horizontal line and one vertical line. The letter Z is composed of two vertical lines, one horizontal line and one oblique angle. The letter sha, three vertical lines, and one horizontal line. Scha, three vertical lines, one horizontal line, and one oblique angle. E is composed of two horizontal lines and one discontinuous curve. And ya, one vertical line, one acute angle, and one discontinuous curve. Ya looks like the English R, only flipped. 
but you don't see this pattern of features in English. When you learn Russian, you learn to recognize that as the letter Ya. Written Hebrew has a somewhat different set of elementary features, only some of which overlap with English or Greek or Russian, but more importantly, different kinds of combinations of these features, different patterns. When you learn to read Hebrew, you learn to recognize these patterns as meaningful. And written Arabic also has a different orthography, different from English and Russian and Greek, but also different from Hebrew. By just looking at these six letters, you get a sense of how, in written Arabic, each of the letters is composed of a different set of elementary features, strokes, dots, and the like. The point here is that letters of Greek, Russian, Hebrew, and Arabic are simply meaningless to someone who doesn't know the language. It's all Greek to them. These orthographic rules must be mastered in order to read or write in a particular language. But once they become fluent readers and writers, they become unconscious, and we can read or write them automatically. So in reading, the page or computer screen presents to us some graphemic information. We use something like feature detectors to analyze this graphemic information into elementary features. And then we recognize particular combinations of features as associated with various letter codes to learn that a single vertical line is an I, a couple of discontinuous curves is an S, and so on. The process of pattern recognition in reading continues, though, beyond the stage of letter recognition. Letters make up words, and in reading words, skilled readers don't just piece words together. Rather, they recognize words as wholes. When we learn to recognize words in some language, we're engaging in pattern recognition at a somewhat higher level. Again, recognizing letter codes, patterns in spelling, word codes, and even groupings of words is something that has to be learned. It's initially effortful, but as we become skilled at reading and writing a language, this process of pattern recognition becomes automatized through practice. But here again, Notice the implications for the ecological view of perception. There's something about an S that makes it a combination of two particular features, two discontinuous circles. But there's nothing about those two discontinuous circles that makes an S an S. The two discontinuous circles are only an S if you know English. So in order to perceive that pattern of features as an S, as meaningful, you have to know English. You're drawing on your memory, your knowledge of what English letters look like. So all the information isn't in the stimulus. Some of the information needed for letter and word perception is in your head, in your knowledge of what written English looks like. What happens in letter and word perception also happens in speech perception. Each of the phonemes of a spoken language is comprised of a particular set of articulatory features. English phonology is composed of about 40 phonemes, we'll talk about this later, which in turn represent various combinations of just 16 articulatory features. All the consonants in English are produced by just five types of articulation, combined with eight positions of articulation. I don't want you to memorize these terms. They're just there so you can see that we know what these features are. But pay attention to what goes on in your mouth when you pronounce the following consonants. Do it out loud. Pa versus ba. Pa and ba are bilabial, meaning that they involve both of your lips, while plosives like ta and da are alveolar, meaning that the tip of the tongue contacts the ridge of the gum. Pronounce these consonants over a couple of times and just feel what your mouth does. Get a feeling for what these consonants are like in your mouth. Ma is bilabial, 
while na is alveolar. Wa is bilabial, while fa and va are labiodental, meaning that the upper teeth contact the lower lip. Again, before you turn to the next slide, take a few moments to pronounce these syllables over and over again, comparing one to another, and pay close attention to what your tongue, your lips, and your teeth are doing when you pronounce each of these syllables. As with written orthography, each language has a different spoken phonology, and we learn the phonemes that go with each language as we learn the language. As I noted earlier, English has some 40 phonemes, or basic sound features. Hawaiian, by contrast, has only 14 phonemes, which is one reason why Hawaiian words are so long. Hawaiian also has a special phoneme, the glottal stop, that does not occur in English, and which appears in words like Hawaii and Kawaii. Similarly, German has a phoneme, the guttural sound, as in ach or bach, that does not occur in English. Russian has another phoneme, transliterated as szcza, which likewise does not appear in English and many Southern African languages have a special set of click phonemes, such as the sound you make when you express regret, or the command you'd utter to get a horse moving. There are many other examples. Just as readers learn to recognize certain letters as meaningful, so speakers learn to recognize certain sounds. It's all a matter of pattern recognition, acquired through learning and drawing on memory. So the relationship between feature detection and pattern recognition illustrates the basic point that perception requires more than simply unpacking the information in the stimulus. Reading and listening, which, after all, are forms of perception, require the reader or listener to make use of knowledge stored in memory, knowledge acquired through some kind of learning experience. So feature detection and pattern recognition illustrate an important principle in perception, which is that the final percept is a product of two quite different sources of information. First, input from the distal stimulus in the current environment, extracted from the proximal stimulus by things like feature detector mechanisms. Second, knowledge derived from previous experiences, stored in and retrieved from memory, by which we recognize certain patterns of features as meaningful. To some extent, feature detection and pattern recognition illustrate a general principle of bottom-up processing and perception. This is also sometimes referred to as data-driven processing or perceptually driven processing because it begins with the analysis of stimulus input. Bottom-up processing takes as input some lower level representation of the stimulus and generates as output some higher level representation of the stimulus. So for example in visual perception we might move from the retinal image to a representation of the visible surface of the stimulus to a representation of the object itself, and then to a categorization of that object as similar to some objects and different from others. Bottom-up processing takes a low-level representation, works on it, and generates a higher-level representation. But even bottom-up processing requires that the perceiver make use of knowledge about the world stored in memory knowledge that's used to identify and categorize the object of perception. So bottom-up processing requires learning and memory, not just unpacking the stimulus. But it turns out that bottom-up processing isn't all that's involved in perception. Consider a very interesting phenomenon known as the word superiority effect. In this kind of experiment, Subjects are presented with a very brief exposure of either a word or a letter stimulus, and then they're simply asked to decide which of two alternatives was presented to them. 
Was the word coin or join? Or was the letter a C or a J? The finding is that it's easier to identify coin as opposed to join than it is to identify a C as opposed to a J. And this is a puzzle, of course, because the word coin includes the letter C and the word join includes the letter J. So if you've read the word coin, then you've already seen the letter C. In an experiment related to the word superiority effect, Johnston and McClelland asked their subjects to detect the appearance of a particular letter in a four-letter string. This four-letter string was either a real word, like coin or join, or a random string of letters. In addition, half their subjects were instructed to try to see the whole word when it was presented. The other half of the subjects were told to fixate on a particular letter position. They were actually told that if the letter appeared in the string that was about to be presented, it would be in the first position, or the second, or the third, or the fourth, so they knew right where to look. And here are the results of that experiment. On the x-axis, you can see the data for either words or random letter strings. And on the y-axis, you see the percentage of trials on which the subjects were correct. And what you see is a very strong interaction effect, an interaction between the type of string presented to the subjects and the type of instruction given to the subjects as to how they should perform the task. When subjects were presented with whole words, real words, an instruction to try to focus on the whole word led to better performance compared to an instruction that specifically told the subjects where the target letter might appear. When subjects were presented with just a random string of letters, the opposite effect occurred. An instruction to focus on a particular location improved performance, but an instruction to focus on the whole word did not. This effect is known as the word-letter phenomenon. It's easier to identify a letter in the context of a meaningful word than it is to identify a letter in the context of a meaningless string of letters. And the implication is this. We saw earlier that the process of word perception is a matter of extracting the elementary features from the visual input, putting those features together to form letters, and then putting those letters together to form words. But here it looks like a higher level knowledge of words helps us to identify lower level elements like letters. This shouldn't happen if perceptual processing is exclusively bottom up. Data driven processing puts lower level elements together to create higher level elements. The word letter phenomenon shows us that information at the word level can affect the processing of information at the letter level. So perception isn't just bottom-up and data-driven from low-level representations to high-level representations. It's also top-down, so that higher-level representations can influence the processing of lower-level representations. Perception doesn't just move from the stimulus to the concept. It also moves from the concept to the stimulus. Conceptually driven, top-down processing is often called hypothesis-driven processing because it's the perceiver's hypothesis about the stimulus that affects how the stimulus is going to be perceived. It's also called expectation-driven processing because the hypothesis is derived from a particular expectation about what the perceiver is going to see. Perception isn't just a matter of bottom-up processing. It's also a matter of top-down processing. And in fact, the best way to think about perception is that it involves an interplay between these two kinds of processes. Bottom-up processes involve sensory information coming in from the periphery, and top-down processes involve conceptual information coming from central structures. The fact that perception is not just a matter of extracting information from the stimulus is also illustrated by the phenomenon of size constancy. In size constancy, the perceived size of an object does not change 
as its distance from the observer changes. In some ways, this should be surprising because the perceived size of an object is a function of the size of its retinal image, and retinal size varies with the distance between the observer and the object of regard. Remember the size-distance rule we discussed earlier. Therefore, as an object moves closer, its retinal image gets larger, and when it moves away, its retinal image gets smaller. However, under natural viewing conditions, moving objects do not appear to change in size. The stimulus changes, but the perception remains the same. The same thing can happen with shape in the phenomenon of shape constancy. In shape constancy, the perceived shape of an object is invariant over changes in the shape of its retinal image. The shape of a retinal image often changes when an object undergoes some kind of spatial transformation. When a door opens, its retinal image changes from rectangular to trapezoidal, to almost linear if the door is opened all the way so that only its edge is facing towards the perceiver. But again, under natural viewing conditions, perceived shape remains invariant over spatial transformations. We see the door opening and closing, but we do not see it change shape. In perceptual constancies, like size constancy and shape constancy, the pattern of proximal stimulation changes, but the perception of the distal stimulus remains constant. Therefore, it would seem that perception is not entirely driven by the stimulus. Just to repeat, in the perceptual constancies, the pattern of proximal stimulus changes. The retinal image gets larger or smaller or changes shape in one way or another. But the perception of the distal stimulus remains constant. The object is perceived as getting closer, but the perceived size of the object stays the same. Now, to be fair, in some sense, the perceptual constancies are not completely inconsistent with the ecological view. Remember that Gibson always insisted that it was the entire pattern of stimulation, including figure and ground, which provided the information needed for perception. Viewed against the background of trees and other features of the landscape, it's clear that the lion is just coming closer and not changing in size. The relative size of the lion compared to the tree is remaining constant. And it's that relative size that Gibson argues is the real information for the perception of size and distance. Another explanation of phenomena like size constancy was offered by Hermann von Helmholtz in the 19th century in terms of unconscious inferences. In many cases, Helmholtz argued, perceptual constancy reflects an automatic correction of the stimulus input. When we survey the environment, we don't just perceive the object of regard. We perceive it against its background, and these background stimuli can provide distance cues. The perceptual system then takes distance cues into account to make inferences about size, speed, and shape given the perceived distance from the observer to the object. In other words, the visual system applies something like the size-distance rule, assuming that the size of the object is remaining constant. In this case, all the information for perception isn't being provided by the stimulus. Some of the knowledge used in perception is coming from the perceiver him or herself, enabling him or her to make these inferences about what's going on. Helmholtz didn't think that this kind of thing was going on consciously. He admitted that we were unaware of performing these calculations. And he figured that without a knowledge of things like geometry, we probably couldn't even specify what they were. But he argued that we could infer that people actually did make these kinds of calculations from phenomena like size constancy over changes in distance. So now we have two competing theoretical explanations of size constancy, and for that matter, the other kinds of constancy as well. For Gibson, all the information needed for perception to remain constant, despite changes in certain aspects of the stimulus input, 
is provided by the entire pattern of stimulation. For Helmholtz, however, the perceiver adds something to stimulus information, in this case in the form of these unconscious inferences. The ecological view is able to account for the perceptual constancies pretty well, provided that we assume that perceivers really do take advantage of all the information that's available to them in the stimulus. But the ecological view has a lot more difficulty explaining the phenomena of perceptual organization that we discussed in terms of Gestalt psychology. And it has a lot of difficulty with speech perception and letter perception as well, where it's very clear that the perceiver has to draw on knowledge of language. In the next lecture, we'll look at some other phenomena that are problematic for the ecological view and try to come up with a satisfactory alternative.